Good to see so many of you stay with us, and special greetings to my DST 9100 class. Thank you for coming. Uh, we are wrapping up the series today. I mentioned uh, Stephen's book on Nietzsche yesterday. Let me just save or say now about another book that I think is well worthwhile and fits in a little bit with this, this series, in my view, his Revelation and Reconciliation a slim but insightful study of modernity, suggesting that perhaps the issues weren't epistemological only having to do with knowledge, but having to do with the human will and the human heart. And I think you'll agree that we've seen a model of systematic theology over these days approach a very difficult question, not simply as an intellectual riddle, but as something that challenges us, the very fiber of our beings. So I've appreciated uh, this theology of head and heart, and I look forward to the last lecture, as I hope you do. So, welcome, Stephen. Well, thank you yet again, Kevin, and uh, I'd like to express my thanks for the time I've had here. The invitation was a privileged one. I knew I'd enjoy it, and I have done so. And my thanks to you, Kevin Van Hooser, particularly, for all your kindness personally and professionally, the two things are undivided in your case uh, over these last few days. You have given of yourself, and I'm very grateful to you for that. Uh, not you alone. Uh, thanks to you also, Doug, Doug Sweeney, who exhibits what I would think I'd call unfussy solicitude <laughs> on my behalf. Thanks. Thanks very much uh, to you also, Doug. And my thanks, if I, well, I do want to mention two other people, um, Owen Stren and Jeff Fulkerson, who have taken very, very good care of me. People have put themselves out and have been treated in a regal fashion. So many thanks for that. Owen and Jeff, whenever they hear the word social security, will think of me. And uh, if you want to know why, you can ask them that. I I'm not um, lecturing on Romans 9 to 11. Today, if any of you thought I was, do feel free to make uh, a rapid, if dignified, exit at this stage. I'm dealing with something different as we wind up. I've been aware all along of the way in which, uh, really, I'm trying to cover a, a vast area and how, therefore, it seems to be very sketchy, the coverage I'm bound to be giving it. I warned of this, of course, in the very first class and said that uh, detailed exegeses and rigorous analytic philosophical argument would be unavailable. And so it has proved to be. I think that's inevitably the case when you're looking at a theme as big as this. Just before the first, there was a second lecture I referred to a book I'd seen reviewed in Books and Culture. And we talked about it yesterday on predestination in America. And just today in your library, I came across the latest issue of Evangelical Quarterly, which has an article, this is July 2009, an article on predestination in the century before Gottschalk, which will put you back in the 8th century, century before Gottschalk, and an article called Amiraldus Redivivus. Both of which, that's two articles out of four in Evangelical Quarterly, latest issue, both of which deal with themes pertinent to this lecture. So, the stuff is coming out uh, all the time. Now, uh, did I have anything else to say? Yes, I did have one more thing to say. Uh, I have uh, perhaps conveyed a misleading impression, though I hope no proposition of mine has um, been guilty of this, but overall. And I want to, to put the record straight here. Uh, I am not against systematic or conceptual thinking. Of course, systematic and conceptual may not be quite the same thing, but I'm not against either. In fact, I've only been able to operate to the extent I have by attempting to think systematically uh, and conceptually. So I have given the impression, apparently, that I might be opposed to that. I'm not at all. It has to do with both the limits and the nature of the systematic theological enterprise, the kind of conceptual thinking that goes into it, the, the where and the when, rather than the that. So I'm glad of the opportunity to clarify that uh, at the outset here. 
All right, now let's move right on. Whenever the doctrine of election is discussed, it is followed by the question regarding the certainty of salvation. So, Berkauer, near the beginning of his volume on divine election. We should not doubt God's mercy towards all whom he calls. His revelation of himself to us in Jesus Christ comes in and with the summons to repentance, surely a proof that God desires to show mercy. Of his justice we may be equally sure while unsure of our intellectual grasp on it. Of his mercy and his justice towards those who do not hear his call, we shall learn when history has run its present course, even if there are hints abroad right now. But existential uncertainty in connection with election may arise not because of any doubt about God's character, but because of the implications of the fact that not all are elect. While I may believe that this casts no shadow over God, we dealt with that a little bit uh, last lecture, I may feel that it does cast a shadow over me because I do not know whether I am amongst the elect. And so we turn to the classic question of assurance. That will occupy the first part, between half and two-thirds uh, of this session. The question about assurance can be formed and posed in several ways that lack any reference to election. Am I sure that I am a Christian? Am I sure that Christ died for me? Am I sure that I shall be kept to the end? The Christian pastor will, on the one hand, discriminate between the questions people ask and, on the other, probe below the external form of question in order to get at the underlying issue. That involves relating question to life context, learning and discerning what the questioner is passively enduring or actively doing in life when not asking the question. Question and answer must be considered in relation to age and stage, physical and spiritual. In the context of our present inquiry, our question must be addressed very generally and worded with specific reference to election. Does the fact that some, but not all, are predestined to life rob the believer of a well-grounded assurance and security in salvation? The New Testament presents us with a grand unity of tenses, salvation, past, present, and future, and exhorts us to assurance in Christ who holds together yesterday, today, and tomorrow. How does this work out in the light of predestination? If the question of assurance has many forms, the Puritans between them propose as many distinctions in answering it. In Dewey Wallace's words, the piety of predestinarian grace as an experience was particularly focused on providing assurance and certainty in the Puritans. Reformed emphasis on the decree of reprobation, along with predestination to life, caused assurance to be a particularly acute problem in Reformed theology from its earliest stages, ensuring that Luther's struggles in his late medieval context were not entirely a thing of the past. Calvin himself insistently sought to persuade his hearers and readers that God's election, far from threatening assurance, grounded it. Commenting on 2 Corinthians 13.5, do you not realize that Christ is in you unless, of course, you are Ad dokimoi, something like fail the test. Calvin renders ad dokimai, ad dokimoi, reprobate. Do you not realize you're reprobate if you're not assured? He proceeds to state that Paul declares that those who doubt their possession of Christ and their membership in his body are reprobates. A worried Charles Hodge protested that Calvin got things precisely the long, wrong way around that this passage actually teaches us that assurance is not essential to faith, although Hodge was quick to point out that Calvin did not always so speak, speaking as though lack of assurance was proof of lack of faith. Calvin certainly turned in many theological directions in order to show how election was conducive to assurance, sometimes connecting it with Christ so that we look to him for evidence of our election, 
and thus are assured, sometimes the witness of the Spirit within us, which is how we know that we are electing Christ. But even if it is impossible to fix a gulf between Calvinism and Calvin at this point, the tradition saw fit to develop Calvin's theology further, and it is understandable that this could take the form of emphasizing our sanctification as a demonstration of our election. We find this in Beza. Says Beza in the Confessio Christiani Fidei, seeing that good works are for us the certain evidences of faith, they also bring to us afterwards the certainty of our eternal election. As he puts it in a book of Christian questions and answers, but whither may I flee for succor in the perilous temptations of particular election? Answer, unto the effects whereby the spiritual life is certainly discerned, and so consequently our election, like as the life of the body is perceived by feeling and moving, that I am chosen, I shall perceive first by that holiness or sanctification begun in me, that is to say, my hating of sin and by my loving of righteousness. Hereunto, still quoting Beza, hereunto I shall add the witness of the Holy Ghost, comforting my conscience. Upon this sanctification and comfort of the Holy Ghost, we gather faith, and thereby we rise up unto Christ, to whom whosoever is given is of necessity chosen in him from afore all worlds. Beta does not offer only this ground of assurance, and of course he regards sanctification as a ground of assurance, not of salvation. We begin at the point to which God has brought us, our developing sanctification, in order to ascend in assurance to the grand beginning in God's eternal election. William Perkins says something similar. Although in both his famous golden chain and in a brief exposition of Christian doctrine he gives as well, he actually refers first to the inward testimony of the Spirit and then to the fruit of faith in our lives. If you cannot see the flame, you can feel the heat, he says. If inward testimony does not give assurance, our deeds will deliver the proof. I said that this is an understandable development within the broad framework of Calvin's theology because we can see why the contemplation of God's electing decree in itself may not bring assurance and even why the contemplation of Christ himself may fail to do so. The decree of election is hidden. Jesus Christ is revealed, but as he is the sign of the election of some and not of all, he is not in himself necessarily the sign of God's will towards me. As for the testimony of the Spirit within, how is it discerned? Experience shows, says Calvin, that the reprobate are sometimes affected by almost the same feeling as the elect. The Lord steals into their minds to the extent that his goodness may be tasted without the spirit of adoption in order to render them more convicted and inexcusable. Now, with theology of a kind, it is at least understandable that there is pressure towards grounding assurance in something about me as a unique, unsubstitutable individual and grounding it in something as tangible as can be, the fruit of the Spirit in my life. Nonetheless, it is clear that this produces its own problems. What degree or kind of sanctification breeds well-founded assurance? does not focus on sanctification as a principal source of assurance, all too easily overbalance into a de facto attempt to justify myself by works, and thus to despair or to presumption. In all this, is Christocentric spirituality not in danger of getting lost? Do we so easily forget to reckon with Luther? I quote from uh, his second preface to the book of Revelation. The first preface is a rather dramatic preface uh, in connection with the book of Revelation. If you wanted to teach somewhere and be flung out from teaching in anything like an evangelical seminary, simply read out approvingly the preface 
uh, first written by Luther to the book of Revelation. This is from the second one. Christian is even hidden from himself. He does not see his holiness and virtue, but sees in himself nothing but unholiness and sin. But while I have laid the problem, as it were, the problem that leads to emphasis on sanctification as a ground of assurance, while, while I have laid that problem at the door of reprobation in particular, it seems, it will be urged in response to me that any predestinarian outlook that has conceded to Augustine what I have conceded over these last lectures gets into trouble here, even when it seeks to turn aside from an antecedent reprobative decree. To Quoque, you also, the critic of single predestination will say, whether from a more Calvinistic or Arminian, or any other side. Of course, two quoque travels a rather long way along the trajectory of a boomerang. For if we believe, contra the Council of Trent, for example, that the biblical witness directs us to a subjective assurance of things, things hoped for, subjective as well as objective, and if we believe, contra universalists, that we cannot be assured of the salvation of all, where is assurance consistently located, according to any theology, save by looking at the course of my life? Both our instinctive and theologically tutored piety may bid us look to Jesus Christ, but, we could ask, does he stand before me as the guarantor of my salvation if he does not do so as the guarantor of the salvation of all? Different views on the extent of the atonement will affect our answer to this question in some measure. If the, universe, if the atonement is not universal in scope or intent, if it is a particular atonement, some suppose that the ground for assurance, grounds for assurance are constitutionally unsteady from an objective point of view, despite the best efforts of the Reformed believer to provide theological warrant for the psychological practice of ratcheting up a sense of security. I cannot really look to Jesus Christ for assurance, it will be argued, for the particularity of atonement means that not everyone can even potentially gain an interest in the Savior's blood from an objective point of view. And yet, the reformed believer can respond, is assurance any better procured by belief in a scheme that comprehends universal atonement, whether an Arminian, a Miraldian, or any other version, where predestination still survives one way or another? And where it survives in what some will regard as an attenuated form, does not the power of a valid assurance yet depend on my demonstration in life and deed that I have been chosen? Must not my free will in certain systems strive mightily to get to the end of salvation's road at which point alone I can be really sure of my salvation, past, present, and future? It is not predestination then, it will be said, which forces me to look at the course of my life, Milder or effectively non-predestinarian schemes which fall short of universalism but seek to embrace assurance must look to life no less. If this is problematic for one, the habit of looking to life, it is problematic for all. Now in all this, we may be unhappy about emphasizing the believer's life as a ground of assurance. But I'm, I'm making this point because if this is regarded as the uneasy product of a Calvinism that strongly supports the reprobative decree, we see how readily a Calvinist can show that you end up with the same alleged problem on many other theological schemes. This would not be to deny that one outlook might contribute far more than another to grounding assurance. Barth, for example, has some strong words on the subject of assurance from early in church dogmatics. And his view of election in Jesus Christ appears to do much to promote assurance. And yet, I think this uh, came up last night, did it not? I think yesterday afternoon. Yet, while he separates election from the actual determination of destiny, so long, that is, as universal election does not entail universalism, we might wonder whether he goes quite as far as he wished in securing a steady basis for assurance. But... Does our whole discussion of assurance so far wrongly presuppose that election is a determination of destiny? 
There is scarcely a book in the New Testament that does not warn believers about falling away or assume the possibility of doing so, including those that address the elect in strongest terms as the elect. It is often argued that those who failed to persevere to the end or at the end were never truly numbered amongst the elect, that exhortations to persevere are properly and appropriately directed to Christians, but that warnings about final failure are actually directed at those who are not truly elect or regenerate. Yet, it looks prima facie as though one and the same people that is predestined and even given the assurance of being kept is also warned about the danger of not persevering. It is surely hard to detect discriminations on the surface of the text consistently. Discriminations between true and believers and those who are not true believers when it comes to warnings about perseverance. And I'm not sure that going below the surface yields anything very different. But here, of course, uh, I'm the casualty of the fact, casualty of the fact that we have to treat this so generally. And we must avoid double standards. In another generation, John A. T. Robinson argued that Jesus' warnings about hell were existential, but did not presuppose the proposition that anyone would be there. Jesus, he thought, did not announce a positive destiny. The road that people were walking led to destruction and they must be warned off it, but his words did not entail that any would reach the end of that road. One response to this was that it is immoral as well as incredible to warn of the danger of an eventuality that you know will never come about. Those who maintain the biblical warnings to the elect do not assume that the elect can actually forfeit their salvation, must guard against double standards if they find Robinson wanting on the terms just described. What then? Are we to conclude that the elect can forfeit their salvation? Well, not if we simply look at the other side of the coin and pick out those texts which emphasize the eternal security of the elect. So it may seem that we are here faced with an antinomy, whether or not we call it by that name, and that we have been here before. It will not surprise anyone that Simeon, yes, 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 you knew he'd be coming in, you have probably been running a book on exactly at what moment his name will be introduced. Here he is. It will not surprise anyone that Simeon spoke to this in particular. Within the life of faith, he thought, we must appropriate both promise and solemn warning, and we should not try to relate truths systematically outside the context of the life of faith. Within that life, do they not come together? I quote him. Does not every man, Simeon's language, feel within himself a liableness, yea, a proneness to fall, that there is enough corruption within him eternally to destroy his soul? On the other hand, who that is holding on in the ways of righteousness does not daily ascribe his steadfastness to the influences of that grace which he received from God and look daily to God for more grace in order that he may be kept by his power through faith and to salvation. Now, the second pole of Christian experience here is not stated strongly enough. It is the assurance that we shall be kept, not the sense that grace can keep us, which actually generates the paradox. I prefer to say paradox than antinomy. But what Simeon sought to do is clear enough. And should we not, consistently with the approach taken in previous lectures, side with him here too? Not necessarily. I don't want to be too predictable. Even if we concede the force of his position and agree that there is something to it. So I'm not going to dismiss it, but I want to push this a bit further. In earlier discussion of election, we were dealing with two different groups of people. To one, we assigned responsibility for rejection. To the other, we prohibited self-congratulation on account of predestination. It was argued that the question of the relation of divine human, divine action, sorry, to human action is not existentially important to resolve. I know what I must do without knowing how to conceptualize in theological detail its relationship to what God does. I can know what God does without knowing how to conceptualize in theological detail its relationship to what I must do. That's something I tried to argue briefly uh, yesterday. But the situation which obtains with election and perseverance seems to be different. For here, God seems both to promise that nothing will pluck a person out of his hand, 
and hence to extend assurance, and to instruct one and the same individual to persevere lest he or she forfeit salvation. So there are existential reasons, quite apart from any conceptual ones, for trying to get clear on this. For does this not call into question the degree or even kind of assurance to which I am entitled? As Anthony Burgess put it, is not assurance as wings and legs in a man's service to God? Reference was just made, as you may have noticed, to the individual recipient of promise and warning. But was that rightly said? Prophets often spoke in the name of the Lord to the people collectively, a mixed group of faithful and unfaithful Israelites, characterized characters sometimes steady in either of those ways, sometimes en route from one to the other, sometimes oscillating between states. As Augustine put it in his work on rebuke and grace, those who fall away, the ones who are called, party is concerned, rather than chosen, those who fall away are called elect by those who are ignorant of what they shall be. Whether or not we quite like that formulation, when Paul and his companions lovingly surveyed the churches in their charge or within the remit of their address, they saw much the same thing as the Old Testament prophets and others had seen. They saw the disobedient, those whose faith is skin deep or has never taken root in the heart, coexisting with the zealous, faithful, and joyous, and those at all points in between, whether mobile or fixed in religious affection. They are all there in the church. Collectively, they are addressed as the elect. And they are surely considered, as were the people of Israel, a sanctified people by virtue of their inclusion in the community. I see that Dr. Dana Harris is here. This is something which impresses me in the book of Hebrews, particularly. The questions which arise, it seems to me, in the book of Hebrews, on whether, on the basis of the book of Hebrews for many people, on whether the individual can be regenerate and then fall, fall away, is misplaced. Hebrews is thinking of the people in terms of the exodus from Egypt, out they come from Egypt, and then in the Old Testament narrative, they are sanctified in the wilderness, and of course they can fall away after sanctification. What's the problem? It happened in the Old Testament, and they haven't yet got the promised land. So that is the framework within which uh, it seems to me that Hebrews is operating. So if people, therefore, are members of the community, they can and should be addressed as the elect in the very highest terms. Paul knows from his experience as surely as he knew the story of Israel, and I don't mean, by the way, that Paul wrote Hebrews, in case he misunderstood that. No, I suppose he might have. Paul knows from his experience, as surely as he knew the story of Israel, that within the number of those who receive his undiscriminating address to the collective, there is a rightful place for discrimination to be made. It is not always for him to do it. Not at least in a written letter, though messengers conveying his letters to the congregations doubtless expounded, glossed, applied, what he said, or he leaves it to the Spirit to do the work, whose proper ministry it is to apply this to one person, that to the other. He who alone has final authority to do so by the Spirit, to make this discrimination, those who are warned and those who are promised, he who alone has authority to do that does so in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. If I may apostrophize for a moment, um, from the standpoint of dogmatics, all this may favor the view that election should be treated under the rubric of or in tandem with ecclesiology. But the New Testament is not simply made up of letters to churches. It is made up of letters to individuals and also of gospels. Now, we won't get far in this question without taking these writings seriatim, observing the precise scope of the address and the precise character of the addressees. That we cannot do here. In attending to specifically ecclesial address, I am not denying that promise and warning can apply to one and the same individual. Life is doubtless complicated at this point for those of us who indulge in philosophical theological worry about the meaning of one and the same individual. For those of us who wonder whether from a biblical point of view the person is constituted by act and that it is this not bodily continuity which constitutes personal identity. 
For the present, you'll be relieved to know all that needs to be said is that I'm not denying that one and the same individual can be the recipient of promise and warning. The individual is a homo viator, meaning that inclusively, a person on the way, on the route. With some people, it takes much more time for character to acquire stably formed features than it does for others. And both promise and warning ought to ring in the wayfaring ear, but not always with equivalent decibel strength. I am sometimes meant to hear that warning with a joy and gratitude that leads me to seek God more and in the company of peaceful assurance. Sometimes meant to hear it as a summons to examine with due trepidation what my life is like. In all this, as Paul tells Timothy, the Lord knows who are his, knows when and how they become his in the course of historical time. That time given to us to hear and heed both the promises and the warnings. Our assurance of God's mercy and justice is the assurance that all who meaningfully hear the word are genuinely invited, summoned, and given the opportunity to repent and believe. But that, after all, is only what John Owen described as strictly a state of adherence rather than a state of assurance. It's an intellectual assent. If the question, can I know that I am amongst the elect, is directed by a serious soul willing to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the question must be shifted one step back. Have I responded to the gospel in repentance and faith? For that is how I'm approached by Christ, clothed clothed with the gospel. If I have not so responded, my question about election is in vain, for it is my responsibility to respond to his call. I have no right to inquire about election outside of that response because the reality with which God confronts me at a given time is the reality of the gospel. And we can only handle existentially realistic questions, all right, if we ask and address them precisely in the order, in the way, and at the time that God places them before us. Seth Joshua, a famous Welsh evangelist of another day, and I hope Seth Joshua is required reading in this seminary, Well, I haven't really read him, so if it is required reading, that's amazing. Nor do I know what he wrote for that matter. But anyway, this anecdote. (laughs) Seth Joshua, famous Welsh evangelist of another day, was once interrupted and heckled during a sermon by a hostile listener who told him not to bother to preach because, according to Scripture, God has made a predestining choice. Seth Joshua paused to ask the man where he'd heard or read that, and the answer came back promptly, Romans 8, 29, whereupon Seth Joshua rebuked him for reading and opening other people's letters. That letter was not written for you, he said. I tell you it was written for you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth should have eternal life. That was what was written for you. And he rebuked the man for reading other people's letters. Rather more effectively than I... Well, I could get worked up, if you like. He had a point. Well, obviously, he was Welsh. He had a point. It was not a matter of shunting aside awkward questions until later. The Bible is an open book that speaks openly of election. But that does not mean that I am entitled to ask any question that I like at any time or in any place and assume a religious right to do so. We need the simplicity of the second Helvetic confession, the work of that finest of men, Heinrich Bullinger, exemplar of what Cornelius Venemar called homiletic Augustinianism. The way Bullinger put it in the Second Helvetic Confession is this. If you believe, you may undoubtedly hold that you are elect. Simple truth. But how do I know that I believe? How do I know that I have faith? Well, I'm not, of course, able to cover all the uh, permutations here. As I said at the beginning, much depends on the context in which someone asks the question. We, We are guilty, I think, very often of flattening out these questions in theological literature and forgetting the context in which they're precisely asked. But, but let me just say something briefly to this, uh, whether or not it's better to say it than say nothing, I don't know. But it is faith and not love that justifies, yet it is a faith which has love in its very marrow. For to believe in Christ and to receive Christ is truly to begin to love Christ. 
Faith does not justify by working through love, but the faith that justifies or lays hold on the grace of justification is that faith which works through love. The evidence of love is plainly taught by Jesus. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If I do not keep the commandments, I must ask whether I love. If it is doubtful that I love, I can have no assurance that I have believed. If I have no assurance, no assurance of faith, I cannot know that I am amongst the elect. How well must I keep them to be entitled to assurance? Well, I am under grace, not under law. If I love Jesus Christ, I shall grieve when I disobey, and what I shall seek first is to obey, not to receive assurance. Where there is a desire to keep Christ's commandments rooted in love for him, there needs necessarily be at least some measure of power in one born of the Spirit. But I'm working with very broad brushstrokes here, and perhaps that is more dangerous than saying nothing at all. Richard Baxter taught his people that, quote, to be sure, you should be sure that the first and far greater part of your time, pains, and care, and inquiries be for the getting and increasing of your grace, then for the discerning it. See that you ask ten times at least, how should I get or increase my faith, my love to Christ and to his people? For once that you ask, how shall I know that I believe or love? As the Christian life progresses, the active desire to keep Christ's commandments rooted in our love for him is a ground of assurance that is not at all negligible, and I have a measure of sympathy with the development of early Reformed thought at this point. But the person who asks in this context, in the context of living that kind of life, am I assured of salvation, rightly hoping to receive assurance, is the person committed to perseverance in the strength of that God? And with perseverance comes the real realization that I can look to Christ and Christ alone for my assurance. Indeed, precisely on the path of perseverance do I learn that there is only one in whom I can place faith or turn to for assurance, Jesus Christ himself. Perseverance is thus, I think, a subordinate ground of assurance because it is the context in which I can embrace its principal ground, Jesus Christ himself. Precisely in persevering do I learn of my sinfulness, unworthiness, and proneness to fall. Precisely here do I learn that the whole of my life must live, be lived under the sign of the forgiveness of sin. I've concentrated on the relation of election to perseverance because the question of assurance arose in connection with election. And in this connection, historically, it led to an interest in perseverance among the best-known exemplars of predestinarian piety. But quite independently of historical developments, biblical warnings about perseverance need in any case to be addressed if we are discussing election. However, I am not for a moment suggesting that our assurance can and should take form only after progress is made in the Christian life and not from its very beginning. In attaching to the discussion of election, a discussion of assurance, I have followed the plan followed since the fourth lecture where we discussed the New Testament where the proportion of space devoted to the question of reprobation in that lecture was dictated rather by the history of debates about election than the proportions of scripture itself. Some are of the opinion that the history of theology and the Christian scriptures employ, occupy different worlds in this respect. In his recent detailed study to which I referred by yesterday, or was it on Thursday, of the mission of God, Chris Wright observes that, quote, between election in the Hebrew scriptures of Jesus and election in the formulations of theological systems, there sometimes seems to be a great gulf fixed. Few and narrow are the bridges from one to the other. That's a quotation from him. It is doubtful if we can find much consolation in the word sometimes. There seems to be a great gulf or his confining of biblical reference to the Hebrew scriptures. But does he not exaggerate there? While Old Testament teaching on election has even indirect bearing on the question of life beyond the grave, that was the question we looked at on Thursday of communion with God, 
And while New Testament teaching on election and predestination brings to light, accentuates, and at all events unmistakably refers to post-mortem life, while still being remaining rooted in the Old Testament, can the gulf be really as great as Chris Wright makes out? Is this yet another example of excessive reaction? And if a thinker like Wright, so rooted in Scripture and positive in thinking, not to mention charitable in spirit, if he is capable of that sort of excessive reaction, which I think is what it is, who will stand? Whatever fault we find with him, surely Augustine was justified and correct in interpreting positive predestination as he did. My question, the one I put over the course of the lectures, to the tradition which he inaugurated, concerns the consequent balance as it emerges in his anti-Pelagian writings, the tendency to view predestination to life in contrast to reprobation rather than in contrast to a call genuinely given in time and culpably refused. Many efforts were made in the Middle Ages to modify or mitigate the Augustinian perspective. These ages were, as Yaroslav Pelikan put it, a series of footnotes to Augustine, and at the same time, a series of efforts to amplify and correct the Augustinian legacy. From as early as Prosper of Aquitaine and the Council of Orange, we find the efforts setting in to, to relieve or do something about this Augustinianism, but the theological structure of subsequent debate is already established in considerable measure by the time we get to the bitter exchanges between Gottschalk and Hinkmar in the ninth century, the bitterest of that century's theological controversies. Now, Brother Van Hooser, as I couldn't resist saying yesterday, had predicted that no one had read the book on predestination in America, to which a questioner referred in yesterday's session. I hope that none of you has read the article on predestination in the century prior to Gottschalk. If you do, don't have you, Doug? Uh, he's an ominous presence here, you know. He's, his features are so benign. <laughs> and he'd also read that book by Toysen, wasn't it? Tusen. Tusen, that's right. Just testing you. <laughs> his features are so benign, I fear he will spring here and say, what do you think of the 8th century predestination? <laughs> Thereafter, after the 9th century, uh, the way in which theology was treated as a scientia in the Middle Ages, even when Scotus could insist that it was a scientia practica, practical science, even then, the way it was treated prevented, as far as I can see, the problematic from escaping from the framework in which Augustine had placed it. There is in Lutheran Calvin a freshness of general theological approach Yet in practice, they do not move beyond Augustine here. Calvin, in fact, solidifies Augustine's structures. Maybe there are seeds in Luther of the modification to Augustine found in 16th century Lutheranism, maybe at least a principle which uh, began, which went, was given systematic theological attention, moved the Lutheran tradition into a different position to the Reformed. Maybe that was the case certainly a different position very much to the Genevan Reformed. And the divergence which actually occurred, whether or not rooted in Luther, the divergence that actually occurred between Lutherans and Calvinists at the end of the 17th century uh, resulted in what Bavinck described as this situation. I quote here from his Reformed Dogmatics. The difference between Reformed and Lutheran Christianity seems to be best conveyed by saying that the Reformed Christian thinks theologically, the Lutheran anthropologically. The Reformed person is not content with an exclusively historical stance, but raises his sights to the idea, the eternal decree of God. By contrast, the Lutheran takes his position in the midst of the history of redemption and feels no need to enter more deeply into the counsel of God. For the Reformed, therefore, election is the heart of the church. For Lutherans, justification is the article by which the church stands or falls. Among the former, the primary question is, how is the glory of God advanced? 
Among the latter, the Lutherans, the question is, how does a human get saved? Now, I agree with Bavink that election should not be of less interest in the church than justification. And even with some qualification, agree with him on the way to order the relationship of the two. I also agree, agree that there is primacy to the question, how is the glory of God advanced? But I think that in this quotation, he's mistaken in his judgment that we fulfill our theological responsibilities here by tracking down decrees. If we seek to behold the glory of God, we must behold it, must we not, in the face of Jesus Christ, in history, cross, and resurrection. The Lutheran way of maintaining what we may want to call paradox in relation to election, thus, I confess, seems to me to accord more closely to the biblical revelation than the Reformed in that particular respect. Of course, there's a limited comparison. Furthermore, I'm not even bringing in other streams which could be brought in, such as the Anglican. But I personally am not enamored of the partisanship which so easily creeps in with words like Lutheran and Reformed. In any case, Bullinger's position in Zurich shows a different side to the Reformed tradition in Geneva, though that does not mean that I buy into the claim that Bullinger inaugurates a radically different Reformed tradition from Calvin. It is possible for someone who concludes, as I do, on election, to sympathize with both Arminius and Wesley while disagreeing with them on the pivotal point of Augustinian single predestination. And this reminds us of something easily overlooked in treating election as I have done. But overlooking it involves us in distortion, distorting our perspectives on it, on election that is. In the first lecture, I indicated the difficulty with deducing a conclusion about election from a consideration of divine perfections. In the second, in connection with Bart, I suggested much the same thing in relation to a Christological basis for deduction. At the same time, our view of God constitutes the center of our theology and is supremely in Christ that we see him. It is possible in principle to agree with for example, Augustine, rather than Wesley, on election, but find Wesley's understanding of God closer than that of Augustine to the revelation of God in Christ. In that case, in case a person was like that, that person would be saying that an Augustinian understanding of predestination was marred by its enclosure within an Augustinian doctrine of God, and that Wesley's doctrine of God was vitiated by his understanding of election. I am neither adopting nor rejecting that position, but it is important to signal its possibility. While doctrines of God and election are intertwined in the thought of a given author, it by no means follows that their logical connection is invariant, predictable, and uniform. Fundamental intuitions about, what, about God will drive a theology considered as a whole but not entail narrowly what is believed in its various parts. Our doctrine of election is an important part of our theology, but it is not the whole of it. In the first lecture, I noted the two difficulties that face us in addressing this problem, the problem of election. One was that very different notions of God are involved. What I've said above about the possibility of preferring the notion of God in a system which we believe is mistaken about election does not mean the doctrines of election may not be expressive of certain ways of viewing God. Certainly in relation to our doctrine of God, we must exhibit the same humility as we profess to do before God himself. It is with all the saints, says Paul to the Ephesians, that I must comprehend God and grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love, that surpasses knowledge. We must comprehend with all the saints because it is certainly too great for me to grasp on my own. 
A conviction that we need each other to understand God in Christ means that I need those with whom I disagree on election, and they need me. I believe that this frame of mind would do more to serve the cause of the kingdom of Christ as the saints ruminate on election than the most brilliant exhibition of a theological Einsteinianship that succeeded somehow in coming up with a theological theory on election. The second difficulty indicated was the perhaps peculiar, certainly marked intractability of disagreement on the question of election. One way or another, this has caused many theologians to take up a conciliatory stance on this question. And we have a lot to learn from the 16th century Butzers, 17th century Baxters, 18th century Doddridges, 19th century, yes, of course, although he's 18th century as well, Simeons of this world. I'm not going to risk coming up with any 20th century figures because that's too close to home. It may generate the very kind of argument I'm hoping to avoid. The tension between love and truth is hard to relax or eliminate in the Christian life. Mention love in some circles and the very word causes the brow to darken. Watch out. Start talking about love, and you'll be a compromiser in no time. Mention truth in other circles, and the very word causes a smile to die away. Watch out, start talking about truth, and you'll be a bigot in no time. How far we all must be from deep communion with Christ, in whom love and truth are indissolubly one. Simeon has at least one more card up his sleeve, though so doubtless he did not see it that way and probably didn't believe in playing cards in any case. I probably <laughs> slander the reputation there of a good man. Hear this from Simeon. Now, actually, uh, I was interested a when I came here that um, my good friend Graham Cole uh, makes use of this uh, passage, so it will be familiar to some of you. I hope those of you who know it won't mind my repeating it. Simeon says this. A young minister, about three or four years after he was ordained, had an opportunity of conversing familiarly with the great and venerable leader of the Arminians in this kingdom. And wishing to improve the occasion to the uttermost, he addressed him nearly in the following words. This is the young one to the older one. Young Calvinist to older Arminian. Sir, I understand that you're called an Arminian, and I have been sometimes called a Calvinist, and therefore I suppose we are to draw daggers. But before I consent to begin the combat, with your permission, I will ask you a few questions, not from pertinent curiosity, but for real instruction. Permission being very readily and kindly granted, the young minister proceeded to ask, Pray, sir, do you feel yourself a depraved creature, so depraved that you would never have thought of turning unto God if God had not first put it into your heart? Yes, says the veteran, I do indeed. And do you utterly despair of recommending yourself to God by anything that you can do and look for salvation solely through the blood and righteousness of Christ? Yes, solely through Christ. But sir, supposing you were at first saved by Christ, are you not somehow or other to save yourself afterwards by your own works? No. I must be saved by Christ from first to last. Allowing then that you are first turned by the grace of God, are you not in some way or other to keep yourself by your own power? What then, are you, are you to be upheld every hour and every moment by God as much as an infant in its mother's arms? Yes, altogether. And, and young Calvin is continuing, and is all your hope in the grace and, <laughs> right, and mercy of God to preserve you unto this he heavenly kingdom? Yes, I have no hope but in him. Then, sir, with your leave, I will put up my dagger again. For this is all my Calvinism. This is my election, my justification by faith, my final perseverance. It is in substance all that I hold, and as I hold it. And therefore, if you please, instead of searching out terms and phrases to be a ground of contention between us, we will cordially unite in those things wherein we agree. The Arminian leader was so pleased with the conversation that he made particular mention of it in his journalism. 
Now, modesty forbade Simeon from identifying himself as the young minister and from naming John Wesley as the aged Arminian. Now, Simeon's account here suggests that we might propose viewing Christian doctrine in terms of a distinction between rules and moves. In any game, there are rules, but within the rules, there is a variety of possible moves. Simeon's conversation impels us to ask whether we should proceed in addressing doctrinally divisive issues along these lines. Agreeing on the rules, that being the main thing. And not allowing differences on moves to obscure unities. And keeping in mind the distinction between rules and moves. I do not doubt the value of this, and indeed doubtless many proceed in doctrinal discussion by attending to this distinction, although not under that description. But I fear that it would be impossible to formalize this successfully into a scheme to organize doctrinal debate for at least three reasons. Firstly, we should disagree on the rules. Secondly, we should disagree on when something was a rule and when something was a move. And thirdly, we should disagree on when a move actually was or was not in accordance with the rules. Now, end of that option in Christian doctrine. So although Simeon's approach was most important and most edifying up to a point, formalization will have no more than an ad hoc, ad hominem advantage. The issues which this kind of approach would be designed to order in a more manageable fashion, will return in all their pristine force by another route. This is quite generally true. Impressive and sophisticated work has been done on the nature of theological science. I think, for example, the fruitful work of Tom Torrance on the similarities and contrasts between natural and theological scientific method. Potentially more fruitful still, I think, because of its closer connection with biblical narrative is the kind of work done by Van Balthazar or Kevin Van Hooser here on doctrine as drama. But as Professor Van Hooser, I think, will be the first to acknowledge, and if not, he will say so, although in a gentlemanly way. While all this allows for a, a most fruitful reconceptualization of the issues in question, the rock of offense or of fortification, that is election, will remain pretty well unassailed by the changing motions of methodological theological seas. Which is not to detract at all from the importance. I support warmly what's being done, of course. But the problems remain. I'd be interested if Kevin wants to remark on that, but that seems to me to be his position. So I'm in agreement. There is a huge and need, sorry, you wonder why I got need and out of need. Uh, this is handwritten, this last bit. And if you could see my handwriting, you'd think that this is a heroic endeavor, far, far outstripping any heroism of the last few lectures. I mean, this is really something to be able to read this. And I can't read it, as you can see. There is a huge need in systematic theology to take instruction from Old Testament scholars in particular on the nature of Hebrew language and Hebrew thought forms so that we can redescribe the issue of necessary, the issue of election and others. Yet, I doubt if the actual root of the problem of election, as it has been identified in the history of theology, will be removed by this attention to Hebrew language and thought forms. Deracination is one operation too many to expect. I may be wrong and certainly regard it as most important to promote all efforts to instruct us in what we may cautiously describe as a Hebraic mode of thought. I certainly am hopeful here. I do think that uh, the dialogue between Old Testament scholars and systematic theologians is crucial and 
there is a world of difference between them very often, I think. And yet, I read Joel Kaminsky's work, to which I referred in one of the lectures, the third one probably, on, on election uh, from the Hebrew, J Jewish thinker, from the Hebrew point of view. Well, well, sorry, from the point of view where the Hebraic thought world is, is, uh, is obviously something in which he is steeped. And still at the end, still at the end, you're left with something not unlike the question of election that has appeared in history of doctrine. So I'm very hopeful, but not, not sure whether in the end we are not dealing with something here rather intractable for reasons which the history of theology has rightly seen. Now, I draw to a close. Wittgenstein made the interesting remark that his mode of thought was Hebraic. And it may seem that the question of election, as I've presented it, cries out for a Wittgensteinian approach. Wittgenstein it was, who insisted that the meaning of our language lies in its use, that we understand concepts by seeing how they shape a form of life. If Simeon has already had Kant for company, and a little Kierkegaard too, how can he decline to take Wittgenstein under his roof? And naturally, attempts have been made to use Wittgenstein in theology, including those by a former teacher of mine, Paul Homer, uh, Tony Thistleton's done a lot of work here, others, Dr. Van Hoos himself, for example. And just over two years ago, Bruce Ashford made a helpful attempt to survey Wittgenstein's impact on theology in an article for JETS. And in fact, a book was published a few months ago, which I have had time to read, but something went terribly wrong at the production editorial stage, so I'm not going to say what book that was. Um, but in principle, it was very illuminating on the question of Wittgenstein and theology. But although my, my approach has seemed to cry out for Wittgenstein to lodge under Simeon's roof, it is not what theology cries out for, but what Wittgenstein cries out for that is significant. For Wittgenstein would have been far less interested in the conceptual help he could give theology than in the religious help theology could give him or rather that great center of theology who is no object, certainly no conceptual object. Wittgenstein sought what is deepest in life. If you doubt that, read Yannick and Tulmin's uh, older work now, but very, very helpful, Wittgenstein's Vienna. It's a great place to start. Why have I brought in Wittgenstein? Well, of course, I brought him in a connection with Hebraic mode of thought, but I brought him in particularly also because I flagged up in an earlier lecture the question of whether for apologetic or missionary purposes we need to go beyond the needs of a church, a church which should be able to live with the unresolved riddle of election until the eschaton. Do we, even if the church can live with that, need to go beyond it for apologetic or missionary purposes? Well, I do not doubt that the missionary or apologetic task calls forth special levels or modes of thought which may not be necessary for the nurture of the faithful. Some will say theology should precisely be driven by missionary need. I leave all that aside. It's a complex issue. But Wittgenstein's words to us would be clear. I do not need a systematic resolution of the question of election. I need life. Read him and read about him. And we should heed him, not because Wittgenstein has the right to set an agenda for theology, but because we have gospel reasons for thinking that way as well. I endorse here very much what Michael Horton says in one of his books. Uh, I quote him, it may be chiefly a time, that is ours, may be chiefly a time requiring fresh witness and confession of Christ, not a time chiefly of systematization and new scholastic enterprise. But let's give the last word to Luther. In his 1522 preface to the Epistle of the Romans, just about the same year, I think, or within a year of that preface to the book of Revelation, almost the whole of his attention is given to the first eight chapters. Turning briefly to Breast Nation, Luther says it is only when you are under the cross and suffering that you will learn rightly about predestination. And I can assimilate election into predestination at that point, having tried to make one or two distinctions earlier on Thursday or yesterday.
Suffering creates new alignments. Theological friends part company. Those with theological differences find what they really have or who they really have in common. Suffering also strengthens identity. An Eastern European leader, Christian leader, told me that. Breasted it very much on me. Suffering strengthens identity. That is, he said, suffering for the sake of the gospel. Not the kind of suffering we share with other people, the common lot of humanity. That doesn't strengthen your identity, but this does. Election tells us what our identity is. No, more than that, it gives us our identity. It takes us back even beyond Jesus Christ himself to Father Abraham, into whose covenant family I have been brought and adopted in the election of grace. So the meaning of election is most truly known in suffering. Suffering strengthens a sense of identity. Election gives the reality of identity. More than once in these lectures, I have emphasized election to reign. I am suffering, Paul tells Timothy, because, quote, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. And if we endure, hupo menomenon, patiently hold out, persevere, including through suffering. If we suffer, if we endure, we will also reign with him. And that's the point at which I think in our day, without specifying further because there are different cultures involved, uh, many of you come from different cultures, that is, that is the point I want to come to, that the knowledge of what it means to be elect comes in the course of suffering as a Christian. That is Luther's word to us. And Paul then connects the suffering and reigning. The reigning is something I've tried to make something of um, in the previous lectures. Well, my friends, let me thank you, not just for the privilege of being with you. It's been a delight to be with you this whole time, but also, in light of that last text, for your hupomone, your patience, your perseverance. It's been a long afternoon uh, for you, but I hope we have time for questions. I'm sorry that I've cut it more than I wanted to. Thank you. That was a very rich hour. <clears throat> I'm glad my class was here because I think we saw integrative, interdisciplinary theology displayed before us. Um, a word about the systematics. You talked about the Hebraic mode of thought, attention to particular context, where we are in the storyline, who the addressees are. Are you modeling for us um, a kind of <clears throat> systematics oriented to Sapintia, perhaps, yes. and um, are you able to articulate a theological method, or is it just that you pay attention very carefully to details? Mm -hmm. what, what's the, the principle here? And, and is it perhaps um, a systematics that is in more direct conversation with biblical theology? I don't think you've mentioned it, but uh, if you don't mind stop stepping away from election for a second, just maybe a summary statement <clears throat> about your view of systematic yes. theology as you presented it. Yeah. And then uh, those of you who would like to ask questions, line up behind the microphone so we have about, oh, 20, 20 minutes or so for questions. Professor Van Hooser said, are you modeling for us a systematic theology? And as he was using the phrase, are you modeling for us, I was taking my jacket off. And I thought, no, I certainly am not, and you must be desperate if you think I am. Um, well, I don't, I, I'm sure if I model it, I don't model it well. But, but yes, I suppose, uh, Kevin, this does, uh, my, my take on election does uh, reflect something I hold to be important. And I agree with you on sapientia, wisdom. Whether or not conjoined to some form of scientia knowledge, certainly is the centrality of sapientia. I actually, uh, I'd say two things, I think. The first is that I would not personally want the, the way in which I've sought to approach election to predictably tell everyone how I'd approach every other theological theme too. I think that with a number of issues, Trinity, Christology, sacraments, election, one might press further on in certain ways in some issues than in others. Uh, indeed, 
I think that in certain contexts, one might press on certain ways more than others. I was out in uh, Nigeria last year, and for the second time, and impressed by the fact that where in a Western academic context, I might be fed up of endless ontological debates about the Trinity and think they were futile, speculative, presumptuous, and every stop for my language is decent. That whereas I might have been impressed by that in Western academic context, when you're engaging serious-minded Muslims who are deeply puzzled about what on earth you can be saying about God here, then one needs to push things a bit further. And I think that, uh, I think that I could, I would be happy to take as a model of theological reflection someone like Athanasius, the way in which he approaches homoousios, something I could unpack a bit if people want me to do. So I think that I would not want what I've said today to entail, to be taken to entail, that whatever the topic, whatever the context, I simply have one flat attitude towards speculation of the world. But certainly, theology is sapientia wisdom, yes. Secondly, uh, yes, to cut to the chase and not try to be uh, too complex in thinking about it, I am increasingly impressed by the need in Christian theology, and this would be across the board, but certainly in relation to election, uh, of the need to think hard about the Hebrew language and Hebrew world of thought. Now, I'm well aware of the problems that arise here, aware without being able to competent to address them. When I say Hebrew language, what do I mean? Do I mean that there are grammatical structures that suggest X, Y, Z about theology? No, I don't mean that. We're, we're going to be very, very careful. The relation of words to concepts and to beliefs, how thought forms um, reflect ways of believing and behaving, th those are all complex questions, and I'm way out of my depth there. But in the Old Testament, the knowledge of God is an intimate personal knowledge, a knowledge which has to do with obedience to his law, even when you cannot understand his ways. And I would want systematic theology also to have that particular perspective. Now, that may too, be too general and bland, and you might want to, it's up to you, share your own reflections on this from the standpoint of your own work on drama, narrative, or anything. I'm sure that we'd all be edified by that, if you wish to. Yes, Dr. Williams. Uh, Dr. Van Hooser asked about your suggestion of moving towards more Hebraic thought in theology. Um, in recent years, more postmodern and especially emergent church types have seemed to be rejecting classical Greek thought in theology, but not necessarily postulating where they're grounding their theological workings. I'm wondering what you think about that. Are you rejecting more classical Greek thought in theology in your move towards Hebraic uh, thought? Or how would you flesh that out a little bit more? Right. Thank you. Uh, I don't like to think in terms of big blocks like classical Greek thought. Different things went on in classical Greek thought. Are we thinking of Plato? Are we thinking of Aristotle? What Aristotle are we thinking of? After all, the Aristotle that was, um, that was known about uh, until the, the development of the high Middle Ages was different from the one known about afterwards when works began to be translated from uh, Greek into Arabic, and then into Latin or Greek into Syriac, into Latin or whatever, D different paths. So, I'd want to look, I would not want to think about Greek thought as such. I'd like to see Plato on this, or Aristotle on this. And beyond those, uh, uh, one would need to reckon with the skeptics, the Greek skeptics. There is a case for saying that Wittgenstein stood in that tradition, I think, in some ways. So you may think this is evasive, and if so, spring up again and go to the microphone. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to say anything about Greek thought in general. Having said that, I should perhaps shut up. <laughs> let's, let's look at things in their particularity. I, I welcome the analytic help given by Aristotelian ways of thought 
even though one might reject certain things in Aristotelianism. Uh, what I do not welcome is the incorporation of what might be called Aristotelian ways of thought, by which I'm thinking, uh, by which I have in mind there, a kind of uh, application of meticulous, meticulous application of notions of causality to issues of election. I don't welcome that sort of wholesale incorporation as though uh, it could help us resolve the question of election or predestination. It'll make certain ad hoc distinctions of very important kind. And even when Aristotelianism was challenged, rightly or wrongly, by Ramus and uh, the, the Ramus logic, which became so important, uh, including here, of course, in, in the US, even when that happens, I, I'm, not, I'm not partial to the excessive use of Ramus logic as though its way of organizing schemes of thought is going to solve these things for us. So I suppose in a way which I hope is not clumsy, which I hope is well informed, needing to be informed by others, certainly, I would still, I'd still up to a point uh, want to contrast Hebraic modes of thought with certain Greek modes of thought, yes. And then you have to ask about Latinate modes of thought, too. And, of course, some, some people might, might hate this whole discussion. What do you mean Hebraic modes, Greek modes, Latinate modes? Everything in its place, doesn't it? I mean, to say of Aquinas um, that, uh, to say of Aquinas, I think it was Atien Gilson, great historian of medieval philosophy, greatest in his day. It was said uh, by Gilson of Aquinas, he who stepped into Aquinas' enchanted world will never want to step out again. And he also, so it's dangerous to step in. Uh, but he also says of Aquinas, everything is placed in a place for everything. And there's a lot in that, I think. Let's, let's learn from the Greeks here and there. Yes. So following up on the by Hebraic modes of thought plural, are you thinking about wisdom literature versus the prophets versus the Deuteronomist? Is that what you have in mind, or are you thinking of a different level of Hebraic? I was wanting to include all those. I wasn't wanting to positively contrast, say, Deuteronomists and prophetic and uh, wisdom. Uh, but by saying modes, I was using it loose, loosely. I could say mode, I suppose, but I didn't want to give the impression that there was just one Hebraic mode of thought. Uh, after all, despite the remarkable consistency of, uh, of um, what you might call the world of thought over the vast extent of the Hebrew scriptures, it does span a long time. And I don't want to say that what appears in one author will necessarily be something which also characterizes the thinking or the expression of another author. So it's, I suppose, Kevin, it's a slightly lazy way of uh, avoiding getting myself into trouble by saying Hebraic mode of thought. By modes, I mean loosely, loosely in this context. I mean those ways of thinking, as far as we can discern them, that surface in the text of the Old Testament. How would you distinguish that proposal from perhaps a more traditional way of thinking about first order, second order doctrine and um, so perhaps on election, one might say that, look, these different traditions believe in election and believe in what God is doing on behalf of the elect. And then ways in which we might parse that might be demoted in terms of significance. I think Chrysostom famously uh, put that um, um, in the tradition. So how would you distinguish that way of thinking about it from the moves and rules? Yeah. But perhaps you're backing away from that. So. Well, thank you for that nice, pacific, conciliatory question, Hans. Uh, you're a dangerous man. You read my work and uh, <laughs> call me to account on its basis, quite rightly. Let me answer the second question first. The distinction between the rules and moves proposal and first and second order doctrines is this. I might say that all who are Christian ought to affirm that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. And there we are talking about something like a first order doctrine in the way you've referred to it, I think. But I might say that on questions of church government, we must agree to differ. Congregationalist, Episcopal, Presbyterian. I might say all questions of church government are second order 
Now there, I'm simply distinguished between the rank, as it were, of doctrines, some being more fundamental than others. The rules moves distinction is a different one. It has to do with the way you conceive statements, particular statements, in relation to any doctrine, church government, incarnation, or anything, whether you conceive them along the lines of detailed elaborations or general rules. I mean, what Simeon is doing there, not going by that name, of course, was actually stating rules. He was saying to John Wesley, if you affirm these things, even though from that point onwards, you and I will affirm different ways of understanding these things, still, if we affirm these things, we are affirming what matters for us. In other words, saying these are the rules. If you, if you stay within those rules, there are different moves possible. Am I backing off from it? Uh, it's a good question because I can see how it might, uh, it might be appear to be backing off from it. Uh, to some extent, I am perhaps, but not, not really. Put it like this. What I tried to affirm today was that it has considerable ad hoc uh, significance, I think. I think if we can converse with each other, as Simeon did with Wesley, and keep in mind the distinction between rules and moves, even though we might prefer some other terminology, then I think that will take us a very long way. My problem, as I was expressing here, was that it's just a question of how far it takes you. If you then try to formalize it and do Christian doctrine, as it were, by the means from now on of rules rather than moves, you will simply get yourself back into the old, the old tangle. So it is an important advanced step for us to take in certain contexts, but it'll only take us one step, only take us so far. So I hope there is a consistency in what I said today with what I said then, but you're quite right to, to challenge me on that because I am aware that there is a more positive spin on it in that piece than, uh, than I've given today. And at least in the PhD community here, we've been really challenged to, real, to think that um, scripture shapes not only uh, the material or the content of our theology, but also the form. I think you saw that when Dr. Van Hooser was raising questions about genre. So I was a little bit surprised when pushing the Hebraic thought, what you pulled back to is ancient Near Eastern context. So it sounds like you're saying not really Hebraic thought, but ancient Near Eastern thought. Uh, and if I am hearing you rightly, then I'd like to ask a follow-up question of what makes ancient Near Eastern thought particularly um, more illuminating than Greek thought? Why give priority to one cultural manifestation of thinking as opposed to another if it's not theologically grounded um, in the canon itself or in the redemptive community. And then second, from a different perspective, yeah. if you're pushing away from logical line of inquiry, scientia, what exactly do you understand as exegetical method? Can you, can you repeat the first part of the last question? Something, something uh, yeah, about sorry. exegetical method. It was I who lapsed in concentration, so I was thinking about the first one. Sorry. I'm a little nervous. I have to yeah. settle down. Um, so what, moving away from logic, how would you articulate an exegetical method? An ex, how would we talk about uh, our reading of the text? OK, on the first one, um, I was not picking out uh, ancient Near Eastern thought as a mode of thought which is to be commended in theology as such. My reference to ancient Near Eastern modes of thought only came in when Professor Van Hooser raised the question of distinctively Hebraic modes of thought. It's that word, that uh, adjective, which led me into that remark. Because I don't want to think uh, of modes of thought, like Greek modes of thought, or Latin modes of thought, or, or perhaps modes in plural we could do, but, but I don't want to say there is an ancient Near Eastern way of thinking or some such thing. I'm not concerned about where what I've called a Hebraic mode of thought, happy to nuance that. I'm not concerned about how it relates exactly to non-Hebraic uh, modes of thought because it's going to relate in presumably different ways. It's going to relate one way to certain modes of thought in surrounding cultures, another way to certain modes of Greek thought. What, what I want to do is to capture, as far as I can, what it is that is going on in the Old Testament here. To think 
Jewishly on an Old Testament basis. However that is related to anybody else in the ancient Near East uh, or Greece. And if someone says to me, ah, oh, well, now hang on, you know, your Jewish thinking. Any other people did that too. I would say, fine. That's not for me to work out. That's for you to tell me. Now, the second question is a daunting one. How does one read scripture? I think is what you asked, doesn't it? <laughs> Jeff, you've got me there. I don't know how to answer that one. Um, would it be fair to ask you to, to push that a little bit, the relational logic to exegesis? Uh, is what you're asking me this? Given my refusal to tie up logical loose ends, what implications does that have for the exegetical task as far as I'm seeing it? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, I'd say it's Sorry to bring you back again. Sure, Mike. that's the gist of it. Uh, what, what, is, what would exposition look like? What would, um, how would you speak about something that's been spoken? complex question, isn't it? Um, by which I mean not that the answer is complex, but there are lots of questions in that. How would I speak about something spoken about? Are you asking me to line myself up with a particular theory of exegesis, for example? Is that partly what's behind it? I'm pushing you on this simply for me to do justice to it, rather than say something which which would be very, very bland. And forgive me if I'm missing the obvious here. It's not necessarily the question's unclear, it's just there's so much in it. I want to know what I should get hold of. It, it seems to me that the nature of contemporary commentaries mm. is a very logical enterprise, um, very argument-based. Uh, and if I hear you rightly, you are really pushing away from uh, modes of logical thinking in favor of, uh, let's call it a, uh, existential thinking. So uh -huh. uh, let's, well, let, let, me, let me ask the question this way. If you were to compare, say, uh, I won't use any named authors, uh, contemporary commentary and something like Calvin's, where he doesn't really, though he's still very logical, but he's moving very fluidly uh, between the own, his own context and um, the particular phrases in a passage. Um, how do you how do you understand your own method as fitting within that? I'm I'm struggling to articulate it myself. All I'm, I'm when I uh, yeah I guess let me step back again and just say when I read a commentary, what I largely see is logical arguments of a community of commentators yes. interacting with a passage. And I hear you as really pushing away from any type of logical form of knowledge. And if that's the case, then I'm just curious what you understand a commentary or okay. Exe okay. exegesis to look like. Thank you. Thanks. I should have grasped that earlier, perhaps. Um, I, actually, Jeff, I'm not pushing away from any logical form of knowledge. In uh, attempting to exegete a text from Corinthians or Romans or any other book of the Bible, I might find myself doing it much in the same way as, say, Calvin was doing it, with less distinction, no doubt, but I might be approaching it the same way. I might be asking the same sort of questions. I might be asking what do the words mean. I might be asking about genre. I might be asking if I can ascertain it about authorial intention. I might be asking about its place within the whole of, let's say, the epistle, and then within the whole canon of scripture. I'm actually not knocking logic. In fact, my whole discussion from start to finish has presupposed it. Every question asked to me and every response has presupposed it too. Uh, we are exegeting each other as we talk as it were. Now, having said that, let me say two things. Uh, I hope they're pertinent. You can tell me if not, perhaps, if you want. The first is, I do think that we must learn more than we often seem to do from the variety of exegetical methods that have been used in the Christian tradition. You talk about commentaries being logical, but you have the African Christian commentary, uh, which has been produced now. You have Tom Oden doing a lot of work on uh, ancient Christian commentary, and not just Tom Oden, others, like Gerald Bray involved with him. 
And they come, they come to light there uh, ways of tackling a text which are different from the ones you've had in mind. Now, I think we can learn from those ways, as a matter of fact. There is a lot to learn from Augustine here. Uh, while I would not want to employ this as a hermeneutical rule, Augustine's very, very um, searching in De Doctrina Christiana. When Augustine says, you know, you must interpret the text in the way which most conduces to love of God and neighbor. And then he says, if you do that, even if you get it wrong, it won't be all that damaging. You know, even if you've entered the road by the wrong route, you're on the right road. Now, I don't want to affirm that, but it, it, it makes me think. And I want, therefore, to to think in terms of um, exegesis, both as practiced by someone like Calvin, who had a superb exegetes head on him, and as others have in the Christian tradition. There was a second thing I was going to say, and I've forgotten what it is, uh, I'm afraid, having talked too long in the first place. It's just gone out of my mind for a moment, and there's no point in my standing here wondering if it was. You wait, my friend, till you're my age. <laughs> okay, David, we have a final question for this oh. evening. In the beginning of your lecture, you discussed the question of assurance, and you explored how various traditions um, sought to solve that problem with recourse to either the subjective criteria. So for instance, in the Reformed, you mentioned Beza. Um, how one resolves whether or not one is indeed elect has yeah. to do with examining one's own life. Mm -hmm. And then you also discussed how there was, perhaps as a backlash against that, others who would emphasize more objective criteria, such as Bart, for instance. Um, and it raised the question for me, I, I wonder what place do you accord for the, the role of the sacraments, which would seem yeah. to be a place where those two intersect. Yeah. Um, and what brought that partially into focus is when you closed with Luther, yes. for, you know, in the context of anfectum, or you know, the, the suffering of the soul, yeah. um, I might add by closing with Luther, as a Lutheran, I found my heart strangely warmed by that. <laughs> but, <laughs> But I, I'm just wondering, and you'll have to forgive me, this is the only lecture that I've been able to attend, so you may have dealt with this at other places, but it would seem that at least for Luther, I can say, um, the sacraments would have been largely operative in how he would have um, parsed out questions of assurance. Yes, so. yes. Thanks very much. Um, let me make two remarks on that. First is a very quick one. Uh, you're quite right, I did contrast Bart with, um, with uh, blessedly Beza and Perkins there. Of course, Bart is extraordinary because you have everything in Bart, and Bart, characteristically, when you wouldn't expect it, does actually give some room. He does this in his theology to the so-called syllogismus practicus, um, where you do examine life. But you're quite right, the contrast is there. Now, secondly, in terms of your main point, I'm grateful to you for that because I, I remarked in conversation to, to someone here, Mary, I think it was to Mary Baker, um, Oh, maybe it wasn't, but because I know you're working in Calvin, I remarked that I had thought of saying something, in thinking about these lectures, about the role of the sacraments in assurance. And yes, I would want to give it a higher place than is often given. Uh, this can be done from within the Calvinist tradition, of course, which I think differs as much from the Zwinglian as it does from the Lutheran, as a matter of fact, uh, though it's sometimes Calvinism Calvin on the sacraments was played down. I'm thinking the Lord's Supper here to the point where he's read as a Zwingli, or thought of as a Zwingli, and tell people to actually read it. Yes, I, I'm grateful to you for that. I do think that the place of the sacraments, we're thinking here of the Lord's Supper, particularly, of course, in, in, uh, in assurance is an important one. And in a comprehensive discussion of assurance, that would have to have been said, and nearly was said. So I'm glad you said it. Somewhere along the line, don't ask where, I remember the second part of my response <laughs> to Jeff. Um, what I wanted to say was that, uh, that I was, what, I, what I'm objecting to is a kind of exegesis which insists as its outcome on the logical systematization of scripture with no loose ends. Having tied up his lecture series with no loose ends, I think that's an appropriate place to finish. I want to thank you again for coming, for giving us
six plus hours of theological discourse that um, has addressed our heads and our hearts. It's very difficult to say meaningful things that we haven't just heard before on this topic. And I think you did give us a strategy to deal with this in, an intractable riddle. So thank you for that. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks again.